Thank you for having me. Um, contrary to what my badge says, I am from New York and not New Jersey. It's a little bit like the difference between coming from Edmonton and coming from Calgary. <laughs> so I hear. So uh, I would like to tell you where I came from. I was born in Ohio. And as a child, I visited those mounds that you saw, that Patrick showed us. And I was very attracted to it. And my mother had, uh, my, I grew up on a farm. My father farmed 150 acres of vegetables. And every one of us children, I was one of six, had to work on the farm. And we had to be in the barn at 7 a.m., ready to wash and sort vegetables and then pack them. I remember as a young child saying to my father when he was yelling at me for not being there at 7. And I said, but Dad, I didn't even get breakfast. And he said, well, then you're going to have to get up earlier. <laughs> I guess he didn't know the guilt card. Um, and so uh, as a young youngster, I learned very early about the importance of growing things and how valuable how you treat the land is. And I remember as a young woman in high school wondering, where did it go with all the garbage? It's like a big problem. And even then, when I didn't know anything about BFI or how they handle things these days, I was worried about what happened to Mother Earth. Now, my father also had three acres of glass under one continuous roof. So in addition to the outdoor farm, we also had a greenhouse. And you know those long English cucumbers that you can get from Leamington? My father was the Johnny Appleseed of the English cucumber, and he brought the seed to North America taught both Canadians and Americans how to grow it, and then developed the equipment that people used to shrink wrap it. Wow. And my father would have the priest come in every crop and bless the crop. And I was so touched by what Patrick had to say, because these are my roots as well. So how did I land in New York City? Uh, I was married for 25 years. I am the proud mother of four grown sons. And uh, when I first got married, my husband was in show business. And so we went to New York because that's where his job opportunity was. He was a young singer who traveled with Doc Severinsen, the band that played for The Tonight Show. And uh, I found that I really, really liked New York. And uh, over time, we migrated, and my husband ended up working for my father as a grower. And it turns out that my husband was able to hear the plants, and they would tell him what they needed. So when he walked through the greenhouse, he could tell what nutrients to put in the water. Um, and of course, my family was behind the early hydroponic work that uh, is now pretty prevalent and my brothers have both been in the business, and so I know a lot about growing. And as a young woman, I was uh, uh, selected as the regional winner for a youth leadership contest because they asked me the easiest question in the world. They asked me, how do you grow tomatoes? Well, I knew that inside and out, but what I didn't realize is that they were checking to see if all the other things that I said I did, I mean, it was obvious that I was you know, and band and drum and all that jazz, but what about, did she really work on the farm, you know? And so I have a deep, deep love for the land. And when my youngest son graduated from college, I was living in Wisconsin, <clears throat> where I'd raised my children. And um, my husband and I, after 25 years, were uh, complete. And so the last 10 years of raising our sons was uh, under my watch. And um, I had been teaching the Merkaba work for about 10 years at that point. 
and I was working part-time doing that and full-time at a uh, corporate career. And so I was, I was wanting to let go of my home because I felt it would free me to do something even bigger. So I asked in meditation where I should live and I was told that I had earned the right to live anywhere I wanted. And so I asked if I could live in New York, and it was a great yes. And although I have a home in New York, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world because I spend so much time traveling all over and working with people. I have taught over 10,000 people the sacred meditation called the Merkaba. And in the process, uh, I developed a technique on how to connect with the higher self. Now, in the early years of Drumvelo's work, um, he very early on handed off the Merkaba and its teachings to a group of facilitators, and I was in that first group. Uh, he then realized that he didn't want to run an organization or take care of all the details, administrative or otherwise, so he handed it off then within a very short time, few years, to a couple uh, Ron Holt and Lisa Royal Holt, who then developed a certification program and a facilitator program. Now, I was grandfathered in, but I chose to take whatever training they gave just as a point of humility and a way to make sure that I knew what the young students, young teachers would know in case there was something there that I had not encountered myself. And because I made a strong commitment to reach millions of people with my work, Spirit has taken care of a great deal of the rest. Um, I will tell you that I was a reluctant uh, channel and a reluctant teacher. And only because I have seen teachers abuse the privilege and power that is accorded to them. So if you like what you learned today, I invite you to join us tomorrow. And if you like what you learned from me, I invite you to practice it and share it with others, with my blessing, and turn on the inner guru instead of honoring or adulating the outer guru because we're all inner gurus and my job I believe is to help you reclaim that and remember that. So with that in mind I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this work of the higher self. In the early days of learning the Merkaba, how many of you have either practiced the meditation or have learned it somewhere in a class? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay, well the Merkaba itself is a very powerful tool that you actually activate by remembering and we teach you certain kinds of geometry. We're not going to do that in this class. Um, but the steps are very precise, and after you learn this precision, it's kind of like riding a bike or driving a car. Once you learn it, it becomes second nature. And in the early days, we were not allowed to turn on all the fields until we had permission from our higher self. But there was no training on how to know for sure that it was your higher self that gave you permission. Now, as dowsers, you have the benefit of a tool that helps you know what you suspect. And how many, as dowsers, know the answer to the question they're posing of their pendulum before their pendulum moves? When I first learned to douse, I was astounded that I could see the movement in my head before my pendulum started to move. And I began to you know, understand all this in a whole new way and I began to look at this. Now, one day after taking this, at the time, the, the course was um, uh, a full week long and nine hour days, nine till nine every day. And um, 
there were a couple of incidents that um, really got my attention. And one of them is we did a foot washing exercise right away. And we were supposed to partner with someone in the class and then wash their feet. And they gave us you know, equipment to do that. And talk about a humbling experience. And I had just come out of my marriage. I was very self-conscious. And there were more men in this class than there were women. It was almost 20 people, but there were more men. And so one of the men that I had met at the introductory class approached me and said, would you partner with me? And I had met his wife, and I felt safe. So I said, OK. And he said, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? And I said, no, I'd like to wash your feet first, because I'm like, let me get this over with, because I'm really nervous. You know, my hands are sweating. We won't need any water, you know. And um, so <clears throat> I'm washing his feet, and I'm so self-conscious, because I'm feeling like I'm touching this man intimately. And you know, I, I kind of check in, and, and I get told, just go with the flow and pretend that it's like one of your children. Because I would wash my children's hand, feet you know, and play. We would sit and do like a foot massage and wash like that. And so I did. And I got really into it. And I felt so full of love. And completely forgot that the feet were attached to this guy. <laughs> and when we got all done, um, this man, who's now a good friend of mine, uh, leaned over to the chiropractor next to him and he said, wow, I think I need a cigarette and I don't even smoke. <laughs> so that's what happens when you open your heart. Yes. So after the class, we weren't allowed to activate the Merkaba until we had permission from our higher self. And I was the last person in the class who was getting any of the exercises. You know, a lot of them, the guys would get right away, and then they'd kind of like hover around me. Why wasn't I getting it? <clears throat> and so I became friends with one of the men in the class. And about, I don't know, three weeks, two or three weeks into it, he calls me up and he said, did you get permission from your higher self to activate your Merkaba? And I knew I had. So I said, yeah. And then he put me on the spot. And he said, and did you do it? Because I hadn't. And that's when I realized that I was afraid to trust that guidance. OK? Now, those of you who are beginning dowsers might feel that way even about dowsing. So as I began to work with my higher self, I began to understand that there were many people like me who didn't know for sure what the higher self was, <laughs> how to connect with it, how to know, and so on. And so since 1994, I've been working with this and teaching this. And I have developed with my higher self a set of tools for you that will allow you to have a 100% accurate higher self connection. Now, 